Mala. Hoy en Alas, despegue con The Discovery Channel en el Douglas AD Sky Raider, bombardero y torpedero con base en portaaviones. El Sky Raider evolucionó hasta convertirse en una de las aeronaves más versátiles al servicio de la Armada estadounidense. Este diseño de posguerra prestó sus servicios con diferentes versiones en las guerras de Corea y Vietnam. La habilidad del Sky Raider de portar una gran variedad de armas lo convirtió en una devastadora aeronave de ataque a tierra. Hoy vuele alto con el Douglas AD Sky Raider en ALA. Algunos aviones tienen vidas cortas y llegan generalmente a reflejar las necesidades de su época. Muy pocos aviones permanecen en actividad lo suficiente como para parecer constantes. Este avión estuvo allí lo suficiente para hacer tres aviones diferentes. Inicialmente fue el BT-2D, posteriormente fue el AD y luego fue el A-1. Y tuvo tanto éxito que la única crítica posible fue que no se hubiesen construido más. Sky Raider Douglas A-1. El primer Douglas Skyrider, conocido entonces como el Destroyer 2, despegó en marzo de 1945. Se iniciaba una carrera en el servicio que se alargaría hasta los tiempos de la guerra de Vietnam. Después de que las últimas misiones de combate fueron llevadas a cabo por los A-1 de la naval norteamericana, tanto los americanos como los survietnamitas continuaron utilizando el avión en las costas. El cuándo y dónde voló el último Sky Raider en misión de combate es aún un misterio. Es probable que hayan sido utilizados en el estado africano de Chad en 1979, recientemente. Incluso cuando el desarrollo del Sky Raider estaba aún inconcluso, ya se le consideraba un avión obsoleto. Después de todo, fue diseñado y construido al mismo tiempo que el avión de propulsión a chorro, en una época obsesionada por la velocidad. Mientras otros diseñadores pasaban las noches de largo en busca de la mejor manera de romper la barrera del sonido, los ingenieros de la Douglas estaban ocupados por problemas de vieja data, como los propulsores y motores radiales. No había duda alguna de que el diseño era una cumbre de la aviación por pistones. Pero muchos cuestionaban la necesidad en sí de alcanzar esta cumbre. Una mirada posterior permite apreciar que el Sky Raider fue la suma de una enorme cantidad de conocimientos acumulados con el tiempo. En 1925, just 20 years before the first flight of the Sky Raider, the US Navy had one aircraft carrier. By 1935, This figure had only increased to four. Naval aviation was an experimental area. There was no debate about the use and worth of these big ships, but the navies of the world still assessed each other's strength in the number and caliber of battleship guns deployed. the 20s and 30s, the numbers of ships and planes slowly increased. Experimentation and testing went a long way toward sorting out the systems, methods, and value of naval aviation. The increasing sophistication and expertise of the crews soon demonstrated telling points in the debate about the function and worth of carriers. It became evident to many that the future of naval conflict would be dominated by air power. Pearl Harbor not only settled all arguments from the die-hard battleship supporters. In the Pacific, it also settled the matter in a practical way 
for the moment, the only American force of real power capable of action was the carriers. At the outbreak of war, the carrier complements were, as usual, in transition. It was a major turning point in aviation, with monoplanes taking over from the trusty biplanes. As war started, the planes in use were quickly shown to have major flaws. War demanded different specifications. Fortunately, the conflict in Europe gave a short but significant lead time to aircraft designers, and production was already underway on new, more effective planes. Curtis Helldivers and Grumman Avengers were to carry the bulk of the weight of war for the U.S. ships. These followed the established pattern of two-seat dive bombers and three-seat torpedo bombers. The Helldiver, ordered in 1939 and first flown in 1940, became the standard Navy dive bomber of the last two years of the war. But throughout its career, it was troublesome and displayed several flaws. Among these were instability, an operational range of only 250 miles, and poor maintenance access. The plane had not lived up to expectation as a load carrier or for its short takeoff ability. But the Helldivers were the best planes available for the job, and they were used to good effect. On the other hand, the Grumman Avenger torpedo bombers were a great success. The planes they were to replace, the aging Douglas Devastators, were so outdated that the Avengers were ordered to full production even before the prototype flew. The gamble paid off. With a 2,000-pound bomb or torpedo load, the Avengers, when they went into service, were invaluable, and they were to stay with the fleet until 1954. Había otro mensaje bastante claro. El bosquejo del ataque ofensivo y el bombardero no se adaptaban a los tiempos. El poder de artillería y la velocidad de los caza era tal que no había forma de que un bombardero se protegiese ante estos. Sus tiradores no podían con un ataque de caza y dependían de su propia escolta de cazas para controlar el espacio aéreo. Esto significaba que las ametralladoras giratorias instaladas en los bombarderos eran un desperdicio era preferible utilizar el espacio con bombas y combustible. A pesar de las bajas, es indudable que el poderío naval norteamericano, basado en sus portaaviones, dominó los campos de batalla del Pacífico. Japón perdió 39 buques y botes durante la guerra y solo cuatro de estos fueron hundidos por naves de superficie norteamericanas. Ocho fueron hundidos por submarinos y el resto de ellos, 27, fueron hundidos por aviones despachados desde portaaviones. Naval aviation was clearly one of the most powerful weapons at America's disposal, and plans were developing to meet needs far beyond the war's end. New, reliable and powerful... ...posición nuevos y mejores motores. La experiencia permitía predecir con exactitud el comportamiento de una pieza de diseño. Las lecciones en combate indicaban que el cañonero estaba de sobra y que, de igual manera, un observador o tripulante bombardero eran un desperdicio en un marco aéreo especializado. En la siguiente solicitud abierta de la naval para un avión de ataque, se especificaba un solo tripulante.
Douglas had been with on their submission, the BTD-1 from 1942, but it was clear that the plane, essentially a pre-war design, was no match for its competitors, including the formidable Martin AM-1. While war went on, the situation came to a head on the 16th of June, 1944, at a meeting between the heads of the Douglas team and Navy representatives. The chief designer of the Douglas Navy plant, Ed Heinemann, asked for permission to cancel the plane and use the contract's unexpended funds on a new aircraft. In their hotel, overnight, he and two assistants, working on the basis of the knowledge they had gained in the years since designing the BTD, came up with the outlines for a new plane. The sketches they presented the next morning, accompanied by their technical explanation, intrigued and impressed the Navy's representatives. Douglas was, in effect, allowed to re-enter the competition. They had only nine months to get their plane into the air, and it had to comply with very tight and unforgiving specifications. It was, in fact, nine months and one day, one day late to its first flight. About an hour after takeoff, the test pilot was back on the ground, enthusiastic about the plane. It had exceeded his expectation, as it was to exceed the expectations of many people during its lifetime. But the war was drawing to a conclusion. Douglas, having produced the goods, faced the prospect of the market disappearing. Wartime contracts for 548 planes were cancelled. Three were delivered in 1945, and only another 22 in 1946. But this minimal production saved the Sky Raider. Though the future of a piston engine aircraft seemed questionable, this plane was clearly something to be reckoned with. And in 1947, the Navy purchased 239 in three different versions. In time, the new plane would operate in many other roles. Ambulance, ECM platform, RPV or drone director, target tow, anti-submarine warfare aircraft, night fighter plane, rescue helicopter escort, early warning radar platform, and even as a transport seating 12 passengers. In all, there were to be around 30 major types and about the same number of subtypes. The Sky Raider never ran out of uses. The AD-2 was, uh, was a very stable aircraft. It was not difficult to fly. In fact, to check out and, and from going from one plane to another, going from training command, where I flew Corsairs, to the, to the uh, A-2, uh, merely read the handbook and took an uh, open book test and sat in a cockpit and learned uh, the location of everything. And then it was time to go. It's uh, very quick and a lot of fun. The AD-2 was a good plane to land on a carrier. I went on one full cruise of six months and never got a wave off. And I was not, you know, I was not the exception. It was just a neat plane on a carrier. And when I was a young pilot, I even took off with the flaps up by mistake. Still got airborne. And uh, it was just, it was just fine. Korea saw Sky Raiders thrown into conflict, where they played a major part in that war. Korea brought the world's remaining ideological camps into conflict. Remnants of the 1930s school of dictators would be swept under the skirts of one camp or the other for the next 40 years, and history would come to see the Cold War as a continuation of the Second World War. On the ground, there were times when battles resembled World War I, with the new American technologies of war pitted against infantry armed with rifles and trenches. The helicopter became a major weapon. 
United Nations air domination was, for most of the war, complete. The services of Korea's giant neighbor, China, effectively replaced North Korean forces because these had been destroyed. China is still coy about what it cost to maintain the line near the 38th parallel. But that line would hold, and the war would be settled with pens. The aerial war was shared between generations. Jets were deployed, but their need for long straight runways hampered their effectiveness, especially in the frantic early days of the war as the North Koreans swept the peninsula and captured all but the tiny pocket around Pusan. The Air Force, the Air Force la Fuerza Aérea se veía afectada por tener que volar desde Japón con aviones a chorro de relativo corto alcance. Los portaaviones de la naval fueron asignados en gran parte a apoyar a los soldados que luchaban desesperadamente para mantenerse. Sky Raiders are essentially a big fighter plane. They don't have an internal bomb bay. This was not included for two reasons. One, additional weight in hydraulics and hinges for the doors. And two, it restricted the nature of the load. It was reasoned that strengthened wings with multiple mounts would accommodate a greater range of stores packages. In fact, the Sky Raiders would carry, at one time or another, the whole inventory, including weapons that were rumors or theories in 1944, when the plane was first drawn up. During the Korean War, Sky Raiders took part in highly secret experiments carrying nuclear weapons, and later, in 1953, the AD-4D variant would be developed specifically for that purpose. But it would never be called on to deliver these weapons. It would make and polish its enduring reputation with a range of conventional stores. In the desperate days early in the Korean War, and later as the fighting dragged on, the Sky Raiders were increasingly accepted as being the Navy's big punch. Their varied loads were delivered precisely and effectively, and could include rockets and napalm, and a range of small and large bombs to suit particular targets. Their loads had one other outstanding feature. They were enormous. On several occasions, a Sky Raider would deliver a weight of bombs that was greater than its own weight. Loads of up to 14,000 pounds were carried in a plane that weighed only 11,000 pounds. This was well outside the parameters of what could be expected from most other aircraft in service. And the longer the war went on, the more additional orders flowed into the Douglas factory. The orders had in fact been stockpiling due to delays in delivery. There was a series of problems with a new engine. There had also been problems with the introduction of the plane into service. The design team had expended a great deal of energy on minimizing weight. This led to some modifications to cure stress problems which had developed in the initial carrier trials of the plane. These problems were partly the result of poor landing technique. In response, pilots were given additional practice, while the Sky Raider was also strengthened to withstand heavier impacts. Most of the planes they served with in Korea were to be phased out rapidly. The jets because of the rapid developments in technology, and the piston planes because of their age. The Sky Raider's future was also already being scrutinized in order to develop specifications for a replacement aircraft. 
the conclusion was a tribute to the big Douglas aircraft because the Navy decided to buy three aircraft, splitting the roles performed by the Sky Raider to a range of airframes. In 1949, the future of the ADs could at best have been described as uncertain. Very few could have predicted they would endure long into the jet era. But orders continued, and when production eventually ceased on the 18th of February 1957, 3,180 Sky Raiders had been built. It would be many more years before they would be found in museums. When we would get back to Japan on uh, rest and recreation, if we ever met Army people or Marines that had been on the ground up in the front lines and told them what we flew, they always said, well, you guys are the ones that saved our lives and we wouldn't have your job for anything. Oftentimes, we'd find particularly a Vietnamese pilot who was rather short that we'd have to put a, a seat cushion or a pillow behind them so we could move the, move the Vietnamese pilot forward so that he could get full right rudder, particularly with a heavy load on a short runway where he needed full power instantly. In September 1960, the first Sky Raiders arrived in a new theater of conflict, in a new role as fighters to join the Vietnamese Air Force. In May, a further 25 arrived where they became a major factor in the air war over Vietnam. United States involvement with the Vietnamese Air Force grew, not only in supplying aircraft, but helping in many ways to tune the Vietnamese into a combat-ready force. In 1962, pilot training was transferred to the United States. Coincidentally, military aviation experimentation was being directed toward the question, what type of aircraft would best answer the tactical requirements in counterinsurgency operations? The answer was... La respuesta fue, una aeronave con los atributos del Douglas Sky Rider. U.S. involvement with the Vietnamese. Estados Unidos se involucró formalmente con la Fuerza Aérea Vietnamita en 1955, pero no fue sino hasta principios de los años 60 que llegaron a Vietnam varios consejeros norteamericanos. Los pilotos norteamericanos reemplazaban a los locales. Igualmente se multiplicaron los administradores norteamericanos, las tripulaciones de tierra y los entrenadores, y también, por supuesto, el número de aviones. Also increasing through this time was the level of insurgent activity. The Saigon regime, riddled with corruption and badly out of touch with the population, was tottering along under Ziem. The country was a breeding ground for civil discontent. Leaflet drops and aerial propaganda broadcasting were no answer to the situation. The flow of arms and then troops from the north made the situation in much of the south untenable. For military efforts to work, the nature of the regime would have to change, giving some recognition to the interests of the people. Sadly, southern politics would be limited to a series of presidents. The system persisted. El único movimiento fue un decaimiento gradual que finalmente conduciría a la derrota. When they received their Al recibir los primeros Sky Raider, los vietnamitas se sintieron decepcionados. Esperaban aviones de propulsión a chorro. Sin embargo, el acuerdo de Ginebra prohibía la incursión de armas tan avanzadas al conflicto. La fuerza aérea vietnamita solo recibiría sus primeros aviones a chorro, unos Northrop F-5 en 1967. Mientras tanto, utilizaron una gran variedad de aeronaves en operaciones organizadas y efectivas en contra de las guerrillas.
Spotters and attack aircraft work together closely to provide powerful and precise support to ground operations. Under the close and often hands-on guidance of the U.S. Air Force advisors, the VNAF developed tactical responses to guerrilla operations that were to remain models for much of the war. Smoke markers fired by Cessna bird dogs operating as forward air controllers would indicate targets for the Sky Raiders. In 1962, the name of the Sky Raider changed again with the revision of Navy nomenclature to the A-1. The Sky Raider's third official designation actually suited the plane perfectly. A-1 was certainly an accurate description. Over the skies in Vietnam, Sky Raiders performed an outstanding role in counterinsurgency and another customer, the United States Air Force, was soon to be flying them alongside the Vietnamese. first American involvement in the Vietnam conflict. President Kennedy had promoted counterinsurgency as essential, and Air Force units had grown up around this specialty. Nor had they taken long to arrive in Vietnam with its long-running guerrilla war. Now they were joined by the full weight of the military, and the lessons they had learned were passed into operations on a far grander scale. With the formal commitment of United States forces came a transformation of the conflict. The entire conventional weight of the U.S. was committed in a guerrilla war. Helicopters would be the enduring image of Vietnam as gunships, as troop carriers, and as rescue for downed pilots. Bravo 8-1, airborne at flight of 16, event 101-4, over. Bravo 8-1. This is Clearwater. Roger, your pigeons to Point Cairo, 28014. Over. Now this is the helicopters Roger. provided a focus for forces on the ground and became a persisting symbol of the conflict. The increasing weight of war machinery and new methods of employing it developed along with a bewildering series of political skirmishes. Together, these military and political developments gave new meaning to the expression, the futility of war. U.S. Air Force Sky Raiders had started Vietnam operations in May 1964 with Vietnamese observers who were nominally in charge of activity. The twin-seat A-1Es they used were to be the first of many U.S. Air Force Sky Raiders to serve in the theater. By the time the E's began to run out, the U.S. was fully involved. And they could be replaced with the still numerous single-seaters. The use of these planes alongside Mach 2 jets was not incongruous. It was a result of specialization. Sky Raiders had Los Sky Raiders poseían atributos excepcionales. Las tropas de tierra apreciaban mucho su gran carga y su capacidad de permanecer en los alrededores en su espera. Los pilotos amaban la exactitud que se podía obtener al pilotear un avión tan estable, lento y maniobrable como el A-1. 
También se sentían agradecidos por la gran armadura del avión, capaz de absorber gran cantidad de daños en combate. Durante su larga carrera, los Sky Raider recibieron varios sobrenombres. Hubo una tendencia a llamarlos Pulitzer, pero nunca se extendió. Después de su trabajo en Corea, se les conoció como AD, The Able Dogs, perros capaces. Tenían un sobrenombre más, Spats, y cuando cumplían labores de rescate, se les llamaba Sandy. Su actividad de apoyo cercano fue inigualable. Atacaban con una precisión imposible para una aeronave supersónica. Y actuaban en cualquier condición climática. Cuando los aviones a chorro estaban encerrados, los Sky Raider estaban afuera, trabajando. Es cierto que eran un blanco fácil. A alguien que hubiese pasado un buen rato intentando derribar a un avión Mach 2 con un rifle, habría sonreído de júbilo al ver a un Spad acercándose. Pero los Spad absorbían daños y seguían adelante, al menos hasta regresar a casa, incluso aunque después les resultara imposible volver a volar. La Fuerza Aérea de los Estados Unidos perdió 153 Sky Raider en combate en Vietnam entre 1962 y 1973. Otros 41 fueron listados como pérdidas operacionales. Y si se considera el trabajo que hicieron, este es su testamento. De las pérdidas de la Fuerza Aérea Norteamericana, 146 se debieron a fuego en tierra. Solo tres de estos aviones fueron derribados por Saab y otros dos por aviones MiG. Dos más se perdieron en ataques a bases aéreas. Este es un reflejo de la forma en que operaban, apoyando de cerca a las tropas donde quiera que estuviesen o sirviendo de escoltas a los helicópteros de rescate. Eran trabajos increíblemente peligrosos, día tras día. Si bien el porcentaje de pérdidas de la Fuerza Aérea Norteamericana debidas a fuego de tierra fue del 57%, para el Sky Raider fue de un 75%. On one occasion, we had a four ship of A1Es land at Nakam Phanam, and between us, uh, four A1s, and the two helicopters, there were 619 holes in our aircraft. But that's exciting. Uh, and it was immediate, and oftentimes it was dramatic, uh, high drama over a long period of time. Now we continue with Wings. On the Discovery Channel. The twin seat A1E models that the Air Force had first taken out of Navy mothballs simply wore out. There comes a time in the life of an aircraft when the next rebuild cannot be justified, and the E models had come to that point. The U.S. Air Force would continue to use Sky Raiders, replacing the aging E's with the single seat H model. The last E model flew its final mission on the 10th of April 1967 and was hoisted aboard ship for its journey back to the USA. There was quite a bit of history in that moment. The nickname Spad referred to a First World War biplane. At first, it expressed the scorn of the jet pilots for the lumbering old war horses that cluttered their airfields. However, the spads in Vietnam changed that scorn into grudging respect and then into awe. In time, many of the jet jockeys would owe a great deal to the spads because Vietnam had given the Sky Raiders a new task. Many knowledgeable people maintain that the spads found their finest hour in this new role. Rescue Helicopter Escort. The rescue parties involved a variety of aircraft, 
control aircraft, spotters, the rescue choppers, and the pugnacious A-1s as escorts. The control aircraft would patrol at height, listening for the radio beacon of a downed pilot. After establishing the pilot's whereabouts, a rescue team would be directed to the area. Strike aircraft would also be involved in covering the operation, especially when the rescue was conducted deep inside North Vietnam. The work of these crews in the helicopters and the other aircraft required great courage. Despite the danger, the units pressed each mission as hard as possible, and in the course of the war, were credited with an amazing 3,833 rescues. Rooster Lead, Rooster Lead, this is Crown One. We're verified at your identity. Sandy's are en route. We'll arrive in your area in eight minutes. Jolly Green's in 19 minutes. We have um, called MIGCAP for you. It should be in your area by now. Roger, I have Jolly Ho the MIGCAP. Thank you. Stay in orbit over Red Rooster 2 until Sandy's arrived. Roger, Crown. Hi, uh, Roger, Crown. It's Sandy 1. Go ahead. Red Rooster lead is still orbiting over down pilot at coordinates 1020 north, 10550 east. He has reported enemy automatic weapon fire one mile north of down pilot. There may be a lot more around the pilot himself. Sandy 1, this is Crown. I am designating you on scene commander. Take over. Uh, Roger, Crown. I've got it. Sky Raiders filled the role of escort well. They had the endurance to stay aloft for hours. They could quite happily hover along with the slow helicopters. At the location of a rescue, they could bring their firepower into play to suppress any hostile activity in the area, allowing the Jolly Greens to go about their business with little interference. For these missions, the Sky Raiders were fully loaded with ordnance and ammunition. Because of the vulnerability of the helicopters to ground fire, it was essential that enemy activity be suppressed before the choppers presented themselves as stationary targets hovering above the downed crew. As a result, the A-1s would engage in what was referred to as trolling for fire. This consisted of flying low and deliberately drawing fire from enemy guns near the scene. When these guns had been located and silenced, the air would be safer for helicopters. It did, however, make a Sky Raider a dangerous place to be. The rescue team's motto was that others may live. To that end, they were prepared to risk their lives. The para-jumpers, the men who went down the wire to the pilot, were trained scuba divers in case the rescue took place over water. They were qualified parachutists and experts with small arms and hand-to-hand -hand combat. They were also fully trained in first aid. With the rest of the crew, they faced the danger of flying low and slow in their chopper to the rescue site, often under intense fire. Then they left even the aircraft's limited safety to become dangling targets that others may live. The tremendous personal satisfaction I had out of seeing a guy step out of that helicopter was, it was tremendous. It was a very exciting experience from a tactical standpoint. A beautiful thing about the A-1 is that it could stay over the guy for hours on time. Uh, it had a, a versatile load with 15 external stations. You could put a wide variety of ordnance on the aircraft. So it meant that when you got airborne, you could be applied to a wide variety of targets and situations. The disadvantage to the A-1 is obvious because while it was a, an airplane with tremendous staying power, and time in the air, it was very slow. And as a result, it was a, it was a fairly easy target for uh, less sophisticated automatic weapons and anti-air. The Navy had apparently replaced the Sky Raider when it split the roles of the plane among three airframes. The Grumman Tracker was to take over anti-submarine missions. 
Douglas and went into service in 1954. The 1952 Douglas Sky Warrior was to carry out long-range bombing, including nuclear bombing. And the Douglas Skyhawk, the superb A-4, was to do everything else. But no one had told the Sky, Sky Rider. Aún estaban allí en 1964 cuando los portaaviones encontraron en Vietnam a un avión de ataque medio que se mantenía en pie. Por supuesto, los otros aviones también estaban allí, pero entre los propulsores ensordecedores de los Phantom, los Skyhawk y los vigilantes, estaba el rugir palpitante del motor de pistones del Sky Rider. Fueron parte importante del poder de ataque de los portaaviones en los primeros días del conflicto, y sus ataques lentos y precisos llevaron grandes cargas explosivas a sus blancos con efectos devastadores. En contraste con sus camaradas a chorro, era muy posible encontrarlos en el camino de regreso a casa buscando blancos de oportunidad. Su precisión, su gran capacidad de carga y su largo alcance los hicieron valiosos y únicos. But all... Pero todo lo bueno tiene su final. Puesto que las líneas de producción se habían cerrado, solo quedaban los Sky Raider construidos. Estaban envejeciendo. No solo por su fecha de manufactura, también por la gran cantidad de trabajo que habían realizado. Lo que le ocurre a un avión en combate es extraordinario, y los Sky Raider estaban en el proceso de ser reemplazados por un cuarto avión, el Groman A6 Intruder. Si bien algunos fueron revitalizados por la Fuerza Aérea, los A-1 estaban fuera de servicio, y esta vez era para siempre. On Sunday, the 20th of February, 1968, Lieutenant Theodore Hill landed his Sky Raider on the USS Coral Sea after completing a combat mission over Vietnam. He was 23 years old, and the Sky Raider had been in service for 23 years. He had just completed the last combat mission of U.S. Navy Sky Raiders. That was it. The old planes had finished their Navy service. No amount of polishing could extend their lifespan. They could still have been loaded with arms and sent on more missions, but it was time to call it a day. After a career as a full-time anachronism, the Sky Raider had finally earned a long overdue retirement. Their replacements were already in service. Indeed, some of their replacements were due for replacement themselves. Pilots had a love affair with their A-1s. They were disappointed that they had to give up the Spads. This was no reflection on their new planes, but there was simply no replacement for the seat of your pants flying, the ponderous but dynamic control, the stability, the leisure, the intensity of action, the accuracy and power of the Sky Raiders. They flew such long missions that the pilots often took their lunch with them. Substitutions were made for the Sky Raider, but there was never a real replacement. <laughs> 